You're listening to the Look Right Naked podcast. I'm your host, Eric Bach. This is the podcast for men and women who want to look right naked without living in the gym. If that sounds like you, then you're in the right place. Let's dive in. Are you willing to sacrifice something for the thing that you want most? And if you are and you stick to that, you're going to be rewarded for that you're going to be rewarded in so many ways because you're just like doing what's in alignment for you. Another important point there is like, make sure that that's based on your, what you see as success. It's what you want for your life. And when you do that, everything that you touch is going to turn to gold. Hey, Eric Bach here and welcome to the Look Great Naked podcast. And today I've got my good friend, Gavin McHale. As a former hockey player, kinesiology grad, Kevin McHale followed all the rules. When he started his personal training business in 2012, he had huge aspirations, much like he did in his hockey. But for years after building a somewhat mediocre business, he felt that he was constantly reaching a glass ceiling. And he realized that he was the one person holding himself back from the success that he knew that he could accomplish. And so over the last couple of years and lots of work on himself, Gavin has been able to build a more sustainable and higher paying business and start seeing the hard work that he's putting in different areas come to fruition. And now he helps so many people, not just from the gym world, but business owners across the world to build a resilient mindset and unlock their full human potential. On a personal note, Gavin and I first got acquainted in a business mastermind in our early to mid-20s in San Diego, running around the gas lamp district after way too much vodka. Had a fantastic time as if we were friends who'd known each other for years. Um, and then, you know, later on and most recently, in was I believe January, we, yep. uh, we hung out. We were in Mexico. You were speaking at an event that I was attending. Uh, awesome to see your ascension in terms of business and your personal development. And uh, had some great conversations walking down the beach, smoking cigars on the beach and having a great time. And Gavin, um, I'll let you kick it off in a second. But, you know, one thing that we were discussing both in Cancun and really since then is something I heard from Wes Watson. Wes Watson is a very strong personality on social media. You can check him out, you know, at your own leisure. And speaking at another event, I heard him say, people think that they have business problems. The reality is they have personal problems that fuck up their business. And the same is true in many different areas where we have these glass ceilings, these limiting thoughts that really prevent us from doing the things that we need to do, that we know we need to do. And then we start acting out of our best interest and that can really lower our self-belief and we start to give up. And Gavin is somebody who has personally helped me in many ways in my mindset on top of being an incredible friend. And this is his area of expertise. Gavin, drum roll, please. The floor dude, is yours, brother. Dude, you make me feel like I'm a superstar here. Thank you for thank you for making me feel this way. Um, there's a couple of really great <laughs> things that that you brought in already. Um, you know, on the on the note of the Wes Watson quote, I don't think there's anybody listening to this podcast who doesn't have the tools and like the the strategies that they need to be successful in business and in fitness. So whatever you're here listening for, I don't think there's one person out there that doesn't have those tools. It's just a matter of putting those tools and implementing those tools, right? And so you talk about the personal problems. I'd even go like the step further to like, you know, those personal problems are probably inside your head, right? And they're probably beliefs and they're probably stories that are keeping you safe in some ways, but the problem is they're not serving you in other ways. And so I, I think that provides just a great uh, like leaping off point for us. I, I also want to just, you know, say that that was a real full circle moment for me in January when, you know, one of the great teachers that I had early in my career and someone that I looked up to and still do is Eric Bach. And he was in the in the audience. And I thought that was really, really cool. And I just it was really neat to be able to like speak and see that, you know, that you got value from what I spoke on and then, you know, go to lunch after and just kind of like decompress because it was one of my first big speaking gigs. Um, and so that was a really cool for full circle moment. And then to be able to just like the two of us, like shoot the shit the whole rest of the weekend and, and just really like connect on a deeper level was, was super cool. And, and guys, like if anyone's wondering how that came about, it's, we both just showed up. And we came to live events and we we invested in ourselves and then we became friends too. We have no other reason that we would like, there's no other way we would have met, <laughs> you know? So if you want to meet good yeah, people, yeah. go to events. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Internet is wild, isn't it? It's wild place, man. Yeah. Well, Gavin, I, I think the great place to start, I guess we've already started, you know, we've kind of, some movies will start at the very end and like, Hey, to actually get the whole story, we have to go yeah. back to the beginning. And I think the beginning, we can really take this wherever you want. I think, you know, one story that I've heard you tell, you know, multiple times would be about your hockey career. 
right? Yeah. I don't know if you want to start before that or just kind of leap into that path that you, that you followed. Yeah, I think it's a great place to start because that's where that's where our connection really lands, right? Is in the sporting world. And it's funny, you know, my hockey story, I'm, I'm a Canadian kid, so of course I played hockey, but it's one of those things that I immediately realized that I wasn't a very good player. So I went in goal and I realized I was good at that quickly. And this is a pattern that I saw throughout my life is when I saw that I was good at something, I just kept doing that. But what I didn't realize until later on is like, because of that, I never really faced hardships. Like I never like faced real hardships. You know, I'd go to practice and I'd sweat and I'd, you know, have losses and, and all that kind of stuff. But, but I never really faced those hardships. So like all those lessons that a lot of people got probably yourself included by playing sports. I got a lot of lessons, but I didn't get, I think what the most important one was, which is like learning to deal with failure. And so when I got to the higher levels, you know, I, I worked my way up through like AAA hockey and rep hockey and all that stuff. And then I worked up to the Western Hockey League where, you know, you basically take the best players from every town and city in Western Canada and you smack them all together. Everyone was as good as me. I was, or better. And I was like, I don't like this this sucks. So started facing failure for the first time. We can, we can throw it back all the way to the wonderful Carol Dweck book mindset. You know, I had a very fixed mindset. My, my belief was that failure meant I wasn't good enough, right? Failure meant people won't like me as much. You know, I'm not living up to my potential, all these things. Right. So when I felt that failure, I didn't know what to do with myself. Like I, and, and so I just started to like self implode and, you know, I've told a few stories, one of those in, in that live event in Cancun where, you know, it, it ended up leading to over the course of one and a half seasons that didn't go as planned. It ended up leading to me joining a fight and me getting my face punched in, in front of 10,000 people on new year's Eve in at the end of 2005. And that should have been, a, should have been a sign. Uh, it was a sign from the universe, but I didn't, I chose not to see it. I guess, um, not chose not. I just, I didn't have the skills to see it. And, and so that's where like, you know, it, it was really clear that I was living unconsciously. And, you know, when I think about, about that and, and how I come to a place where I'm talking on a podcast about mindset with someone like you, it's like, it's this total 180. So I think it's a really cool transformation, but that's the story that people need to hear to, to understand where I'm coming from. Yeah. Well, you know, I think you and I both share that. And like, you know, you talk about kind of like the classic, you're the classic hockey bro growing up. And even when we first met and very much mm -hmm. like I had very much that same mindset, just yeah. kind of run through walls you know, just kind of white knuckle everything in terms of life to an extent, you can have some different levels of success doing that simply totally. through having some innate talent and just a, a sheer work ethic. Right. But for a lot of people, what that turns out to be is people kind of work hard, play hard. That's a very simple way to think about it. Right. It's like that classic type A personality where it's, you know, burn a candle at both ends, just kind of sprint through things. And pretty soon you look back and you're like, maybe this isn't serving me anymore. Totally. And that seems like you, you kind of hit a moment, you know, with, with your business, you know, a couple of years down the road where you built into self-reflection. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. I love the way you put that. Like when we met, right. I think 2016, the work hard, play hard was working for us. It was good. You know, we were having fun. We were enjoying ourselves. We were working our asses off, literally burning the candle at both ends. I, I still remember when we roomed together in San Diego and we were out till like four in the morning and then like eight in the morning, the next morning, you had the cold shower going and you're screaming in the shower. And I'm like, oh yeah, let's get the cold shower going. And we're like, coffee, fire it up, monster drink, let's go, you know? Yeah, I just, that sounds horrible to me now. I don't know about you, <laughs> it sounds terrible. So, so yeah, so what happened was, you know, I, I didn't recognize the pattern then. I, and, you know, then I'm, I'm building my business 2016 2017 and i'm seeing people like you and and all these other these these other great trainers go online and i'm like i think i'm pretty good too why can't i go online and build my business but the same thing happened right so i learned the tactics and strategies just like in hockey i you know learned all the skills that i needed to learn and i had this innate talent like you said but that only gets you so far i i got these these tactics and strategies but why aren't these working for me why you know i could get to this this, this level that a lot of people would be happy with, but as you and I know, this brain of ours does isn't happy with that, right? So I wanted to get to that higher level and I just couldn't get there. Like all these tactics and strategies, like, you know, you'd post something and it would pop 
and I'd post sim- something similar and it would just, nothing would happen. Those kind of unexplainable things started leading me down this path, like what's going on? And it wasn't until I saw this pattern keep coming up that I recognized, well, maybe this is something within me, right? Maybe this is something between the ears that's not serving me. This happened in hockey, this happened in my business, this has happened multiple times, what's going on? And that's when I think I started to recognize, as you said, these stories or this these beliefs of who I am aren't serving me anymore. And, and, and if I want to go to the next place and if I want to have the life that I I envision, I'm going to have to change who I am and how I look at the world. Definitely. I mean, there's so many key points in there. And I don't know if I just by sheer chance, probably not, but I started reading The Slight Edge today. Have you read that book? I've heard of it. I haven't read it. Okay. So I'm only 40 pages into this book, so I can't tell the entire thing, obviously. But, <laughs> you know, it's this individual who's talking about two different two different people. One is a beach bum who's, you know, moved out to Daytona Beach because he liked the idea of spring break after dropping out of college nice. and staying in touch with a close friend who had multiple businesses, tens of million dollars in the bank, um, great relationships across the board. And as the story develops, it's the same person. He had the same strategies the entire time. And it wasn't the strategies. It was doing things a little bit differently with a different set of principles and beliefs behind it that led to such a different result. Again, I'm just digging into this book now, but it got me thinking about our conversations, about this conversation here. And even when it comes to fat loss or building muscle, when so many people get frustrated, when they're like, I see this person doing that thing, it's not working for me. Or I'm doing this and it seems like it's working for everybody else. How come I can't get that result? Hey, I've been in great shape before, but I can't stay in great shape now. What is going on? Is it my body? Am I broken? Is there something wrong with me? No. Most likely, one, there's always a consistency element, but sometimes... It's something that's going on between your ears more than anything else. Tell us a little bit more, you know, about these sets of beliefs and kind of shifting your subconscious and and really understanding these beliefs and how that plays a role. Dude, I can't stop thinking about the fact that I need to read this book like yesterday. This sounds amazing because, you know, let me just take that thread and pull it for a second, because I think as you explained it, it's like, oh, well, that, that, that can't be you know, those are two polar opposites. Right. And then you, you you know, you recognize it's the same person. It's like, I hope that that's a recognition for people listening that like, you don't have to fall into the stereotype that you think, right? Like, so if you're, if you're 50 and everyone around you is saying, well, you know, getting older, the joints are thing and it's hard to lose weight and you can't sleep. Like it's bullshit. Cause I know you, Eric have trained people who are 50 and in the best shape of their lives. It's bullshit. And so the, I guess where I'm going with this is we get to choose the story we tell about ourselves. Like we get to write that narrative. I got a, a good coach who said, um, cause he knew I was a sports guy. He said, as soon as you recognize that you're playing the game and you're the referee and you make the rules, everything gets a lot easier because you can change the rules whenever you want. You get to enforce the rules however you want and you get to play the game. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about the identity that you have and the story that you're telling about yourself, right? So no matter what, we all have a set of stories and beliefs that at some point has served us in our lives, right? So Eric and I talked about when we were in our early mid twenties, the story of being, you know, the hockey bro or the frat bro or the football bro or whatever it is that served us. We had a lot of fun. We made a lot of friends. We also, you know, worked our asses off and stacked some cash, right? We, we, it served us really well. And then got married. Eric had, you know, Eric had a family, like things change or, or even just like we wanted to build different businesses. We wanted to live our lives in a different way. You have to change who you are. Right. And, and so I, I like to, I like to look at this like decision making cycle. Right. So. If we want to change, we got to change the decisions we make, right? And the actions we take. And I like to look at this as a cycle, right? So the actions that you take come from an emotional place, right? We all know that we take actions based on emotion. We make decisions based on emotion, based on how we feel. Well, those emotions come from the beliefs that we have about ourselves. They come from the the way that we think we fit into the world. So an event happens, either you know an internal trigger in our brains or an event happens outside of us, we apply a belief to that event 
based on how we view the world and how we view ourselves in the world, then that causes us to feel an emotion, which causes us to make a decision. A lot of people, when they're trying to make a change, let's say, for example, weight loss, it's an easy one to consider, right? Is they change the action, right? They change that last part of the cycle, just like, I'm just going to take different actions, and then I'm just going to pray to God or whatever God I believe in that I can keep taking those different actions. But they still have the belief that they can't control themselves around junk food or they're overweight or they're lazy, right? I remember working with a personal training client when I was in the fitness days that he was trying to lose weight for his wedding, but he kept saying like, yeah, I'm such a fat mess. Like, oh man, I'm so lazy, all this stuff. It's like, dude, you're, you're literally never going to be able to change or you're going to make it a hell of a lot harder believing that. If instead of just trying to frantically change the action, what if we just went deeper and changed the belief that we had about ourselves, changed the story that was in our subconscious brain about who we are and how we fit in the world? If we can do that, which we can, it's not easy, but we can do it. That's what I present on often. If we can go in and change that story and change that belief, then the emotions that we feel are different. And then the actions that we take and the decisions we make are going to be different, which of course will lead to a different outcome. Yeah. And let's even back up a second, a little bit more. I mean, let, let's talk about the conscious versus subconscious and like, like it. how, what percentage, you know, of our decisions are generally made up by our subconscious brain. Like what are like, yeah. how many things are we doing just reactively without even conscious awareness? Yeah. So 95 to 98% of our brain is subconscious right? Which is, which is beliefs, habits, you know, the, the things that we don't consciously think about and two to 5% is, you know, those, the decision-making, the, you know, the logic, all, all the stuff that probably got a lot of the listeners where they are. It's that's two to 5% of your brain. So what a lot of people try and do is they try and change themselves consciously right? They have this goal. I want to lose 10 pounds. So, so I'm consciously going to change, I'm going to change my actions and things like that. Right. But yet they still have these subconscious patterns, right? These subconscious beliefs that aren't serving them or these stories that aren't serving them. Great way to frame it is, uh, if you take my hockey story, for example, right? The failure thing. I was failing, right? I was struggling with hockey. I was letting in lots of goals because I was in this new league that I couldn't keep up with, right? And my belief was that failure meant I wasn't good enough. That was the belief that I applied. So that made me feel angry, made me feel frustrated, made me feel unworthy and powerless, right? So that led me to take actions like giving up on my team, giving up in, in games, not working hard in practice, joining fights like an idiot. That didn't serve me very well. If we had just changed that belief, if we had just shifted the subconscious, failure equals feedback, right? Failure is an opportunity to learn and grow. Well, that would have made me feel a different emotion. I would have felt curiosity. I would have felt intrigue, like, hmm, what's going on here? This isn't working instead of angry. And that would have probably led me to maybe hire a sports psychologist or watch more videos or hire more, hire, you know, talk to my coaches or whatever, something that would have helped me change what was happening. But the problem is this subconscious brain is so difficult to get in there and figure out what these beliefs are. Uh, there's a great book called The Ant and the Elephant. Uh, it's uh, it's kind of like written like a children's book. And the author says yeah. in there, he says, no matter how hard or no matter how far or how fast the ant tries, I can't remember what he says. It's like, no matter how hard it tries to walk east, if the elephant is walking west, the elephant being the subconscious brain, if it's walking west, that ant's not going east, right? So no matter how hard you try with your conscious brain to do something, if your subconscious brain is pulling in the opposite direction, you're screwed. It, you're not going in that direction. So we need to we need to dig in, do the work on the subconscious, and that's gonna that's gonna flip the switch and make everything better. That is where so many people so many people struggle, right? Yeah. And one example, the achiever is a, is a common like archetype, right? The person who always wants to achieve success, maybe to because they feel inadequate. I mean, that was yep. me for a long time with like the sports. I was always a small guy, I had to work hard. Frame was always to be the best. You have to outwork the rest. So I whatnot totally. on everything. Um, and then you eventually learn that that script doesn't always, always serve you because there's kind of a counteracting balance in the stress response that happens with everything else in your body, you know? And so it's understanding sometimes these beliefs that you have can only get you to a certain place and you have to be able to evolve. You have to be able to adapt and doing it is difficult because there's always an attachment to a, some level of success that you've had if you've gotten to a certain area and changing your subconscious beliefs is very hard. It's mm -hmm. very hard because it requires you to have first a lot of introspection 
introspection and reflection, and then proactively think about how you need to change things that you've always done almost in an automatic sense to be able to make a, a shift. Trying to tell a high performer or an achiever, right? Like, like if you're listening to this podcast, I would assume it, you, you want to win, right? You're an achiever, you're a high performer, just like Eric and I are trying to tell that person to slow down and to just like sit and think is like telling them to put pins in their eyes, right? It's like the worst thing that they can think of. Totally. Yep. <laughs> it's like, I hate, I hate every moment of this, right? You want me to sit here and not actually do anything and just think like, are you crazy? Right. And maybe write some things in the journal. I think that's, I've always, well, since I've been through this transition and this transformation that I've been working on over the past few years, whenever that thing feels like the last thing in the world you want to do, you got to lean in. Like that's the thing you need most, right? So if, if, if the hardest thing in the world to you seems like sitting down and being introspective, like Eric just said, I'll encourage you to go do that thing because it's probably easy for you to, you know, go and do more and go and, you know, put, you know, put more effort in, outwork the rest, right? That's, that's like easy for a lot of us, the slowing down and the looking inward. That's a lot more difficult. It is. And so, yeah, we go through this process, trying to uncover what these beliefs are and leading into things that are uncomfortable. I'll tell you even a couple of personal stories for me. Meditation for me is the hardest thing to do in the world sitting still for five minutes and to just be present in something rather than start running through walls and mainline caffeine into my jugular. Like that goes against every fiber of my natural being. And so it, that's one practice I found to be incredibly helpful, but like even something a little bit different, you know, working with, with a coach and we both know um, Annie Yach, who's fantastic in this area as well, was last year, I noticed that my stress, my anxiety would start to kind of climb up right around like two or three in the afternoon because I'm up early. I'm just going nonstop. I expect myself to be the Terminator and to not uh, not fatigue. But life changes. You get, you know, get a little bit older, a few more responsibilities, stress increases. And pretty soon I'm like, I'm hitting this wall. And so what she challenged me to do, she's like, Eric, I want you to take like 20 minutes on the couch that's in your office right over here and just decompress. You don't have to sleep but just close your eyes and breathe and just relax. Right. And so like, that's one thing for me, all of a sudden it's like, Oh, I started really getting tapped. Like, you know what? I'm really running on just pure stress. Yeah. I'm running on, frankly, like some of those initial beliefs that I had when I was younger, that I, I was always a small guy. So I had to be, you know, I had to work harder to get everything. Of course, then my body caught up and I kept that same mindset and it helped for a long period of time. But you get to a period where it's like, just trying to do everything harder. Isn't always going to serve you. It really isn't. And, and in fact, it's probably there, there's that there's that point where it's just completely diminishing, right? To the point where like either even on the like acutely, like you're kind of like a little slower thinking and that on the day. But then as that builds up over weeks and over months, it's like we're at complete burnout, right? Like that's the point where you literally hit burnout and you're snapping at your wife for no reason. And like what's going on, <laughs> right? Yeah. And this is where a lot of people run into issues actually on, on fitness type things as well, where it's, they just want to do more. They want to do yep. more. They want to do more. Um, you know, not they're like, to they're, they're like, wait, I, I hired you as a fitness coach and you're telling me to do less fitness stuff. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Like, Hey, let's do some, uh, some parasympathetic breathing, breathing right here after this workout, you know, because, <laughs> because you need to actually decompress a little bit and not just run on stress, um, you know, to get everything done. But like, that's a very common thing. I think there's some improvements in the industry as a whole, but you see a lot of people, you know, they kind of get obsessed with the calories in calories out perspective. And then the only thing is like, I've got to take calories lower, eat less and work harder to burn more calories. What we don't factor in again, from many sizes, like these are both pretty intense physiological stressors. Stress is systemic, right? We have what we call the allostatic stress load, which is your body cannot differentiate the stress that you have directly from getting caught off in traffic, from a fight at work, from a deadline, from being in a calorie deficit, from high intensity interval training, from going on a depletion carbohydrate you know, type diet plan, right? These are all stressors for your body. And if you never give it time, to recuperate on a physical side, one, you're going to stall out when it comes to being able to make changes from an overall stress perspective. Like that's going to bleed over into your performance at work. It's going to bleed over into how you perform directly, you know, with, with your family and how you show up, like, start running basically on cortisol. And we go into these reactive patterns that we have. And that's where the subconscious beliefs and self-sabotage often, often take hold. Um, I see it with a lot of people on the fitness side. I've seen it, you know, from my consulting on the business side, but you work, especially now with a lot of business owners and high performers. Is this a really common thing that you see? 
Yeah, so what I see, and, and this is one of the things that we've started recognizing recently in, in our in the work that we do, it's the full life that we need to look at, right? Like we're, we're in the business coaching space, but we need to look at their fitness. We need to look at their home life. Like we need to be asking those questions because those give us a huge insight into what's actually going on. And as you said, one of the things that I presented on recently was um, we talked about the subconscious brain. And one of the big pieces of that is co something called the reticular activating system. And the reticular activating system's job is to tell your conscious brain what to focus on. You want to get a new car, your conscious brain sees the new car everywhere, right? When I say, how does your left big toe feel right now? You're like, what the fuck? Why am I thinking about my left big toe? Because right? <laughs> you don't, there's too much to focus on, right? So, so the problem though, the glitch there is that the reticular activating system only looks for evidence of the beliefs that you already have to be true, right? It's, it's a good soldier. It doesn't think for itself. It's just like, okay, you've got this belief that you're not good enough. I'm just going to look for that belief everywhere. Deeper than that, we, our nervous system actually gets addicted to those familiar cycles, even when those familiar cycles don't serve us. So you talk about like the self-sabotage or even the like the chaos or the like the frantic type thing. We get addicted to those, right? And the, and the best uh, analogy or example for this is like, okay, a lot of people say that when they scroll social media, they feel insecure. You're actually not scrolling social media to feel insecure. You're scrolling social media to reaffirm your addiction to insecurity. You're actually using social media to reaffirm your addiction to insecurity or to, you know, you're using money to reaffirm your addiction to anxiety or you're using food to reaffirm your addiction to guilt and to shame. This happens all the time. And this is exactly what we're talking about when it comes to your subconscious patterning is you become addicted to these things. And then the self-sabotaging loop that you get so frustrated with is just so ingrained in you that it's, it becomes harder and harder and harder to pull yourself out of that. And really that, you know, we have to, this is where my favorite Carl Jung quote comes in. The godfather of modern psychology is until you make the unconscious conscious, it will rule your life and you will call it fate. You will say, well, I guess this is just the way it is. Exactly. And then like one thing that comes to mind, and I would like your feedback on this. I've got one particular client who, you know, does very well, works hard in the gym. I mean, up at, you know, four fifteen in the morning, um, crushing workouts, then goes and works, you know, eight to 10 hours a day. And then, you know, does some additional stuff afterward and hits the couch at 10. And by the end of the week, sometimes splurges on diet a little bit. The example last week was like, you know, went out to dinner, you know, I had a, I had a turkey burger and I should have got the fries and just like, I'm a piece of shit for eating this. Right. And it's like putting in so much good quality work in different areas and yet magnifying on this one kind of imperfection. And it just recycles that same loop. If you were talking to this individual and they were starting to go down like this negative mindset loop, like how would you pull out of that? Man, such a good example, because I'm sure a lot of us and, and I'm sitting here going, Eric, are you talking about you? <laughs> <laughs> This client of mine, this friend of mine, I think a big thing, like if we pulled it all the way back, you know, if I was working or talking to this person, I would first, we got to reframe how you look at things, right? So the first thing that we always jump to as high performers, and I'm sure this person jumps to is self-judgment. I'm going to judge myself for this thing. You and I both saw it. At some point in our lives, we needed an ass kicking. We needed the self judgment. We needed to be like, bro, get your ass in gear and figure it out. Then there comes a point where the self judgment doesn't serve us. Like me on the outside looking in as like a, like, um, you know, I like working out and it's fine. Sure, whatever, it's a means to an end, but I don't like, I, I don't like love it that much. Is I'm sitting here going, bro, eat the fries. Like, you know, like just like enjoy yourself. Like, come on. I understand that it, that there's like a totally different mindset there, but like start thinking about the fact that maybe this self judgment isn't serving you. And so the self judgment and whatever comes from that is probably what the addiction is. I would encourage this person to 
when the self judgment comes up, okay, because this is what happens, right? As soon as I do any of this work with someone, we flip the light switch on, and they can't turn the light switch off anymore. They're like, okay, now I'm aware of all this shit. And now I'm judging myself for thinking that like, oh, I can't believe that I'm doing this thing again. Gavin said that is we start to really get into judgment. I just encourage people like as soon as you start to feel the judgment, or even like the anger with yourself or the guilt, it's a great opportunity to get curious. It's a great opportunity to dig Dig in and start asking questions. You're like judging yourself. This person's judging themselves for eating the fries. Like, why do I feel like eating French fries is not good for me? Why do I feel like this is a bad idea? Like, let's get really clear on like, what, where is this patterning coming from? Is it is it because society tells me French fries are bad? Is it because like, I think that, that I can't have anything that's fried? Like, what's going on here? And let's start to dig into that. Because then when you can unpack that, now we're coming from a place of awareness that, you know, awareness of these patterns and these beliefs that we can then use to go like, okay, well, I don't really like that one. That one's not really serving me anymore. Now we can go to work on it. I love that. And uh, you triggered a thought actually from the great philosopher quarterback, Aaron Rodgers, and it was be curious, not judgmental. But I think that's a huge piece, right? Because when we pull back for a second and we realize that every human behavior is generally a reaction to stress, could be distress or eustress, but it is. Right. And so when you pull back and, and we all know this, right? Like good people do things that they're not happy about. Good people do bad things. However you want to quantify that. Right. Shit. Everyone here, everyone who's listening has probably done something that they're disappointed in themselves for doing. Yeah. It's crucial not to judge yourself. It's, it's hard not to judge yourself. You probably still will judge yourself to an extent, but if you can pull back and start to look at why did I do this thing, pull away from that judgment a bit, be a little bit more curious and then gain awareness about what can potentially lead you there. Is that what really sets forth the ability to change and to start to change some of these beliefs? Yeah, awareness is the first step. And one other thing that happens when you when you do that, when you kind of like st start to ask questions is you create some space between the event and your reaction to it or your response to it. If if we just have like the event of eating the fries and then we like immediately react like without giving it any space, we're probably gonna make a like a rash decision and we're gonna go down the spiral and it's not gonna be very good. But if we can say like, hmm, and just take a second, like just take a beat to think about it. It's going to give us more time to be a little more rational about our response and go like, well, maybe I was just fucking hungry and that's okay. And uh, just just on that note, I just want to say like, I know you, you, you know, you may think it's the church of Aaron Rodgers. I'm going to go with Ted Lasso, but Ted Lasso in the picture behind me. But he did also say that Walt Whitman said that. But either way, that's, prob that, <laughs> that's probably it because I know he... Uh, he is a Ted Lasso fan. I think I heard him calling Pat McAfee. So, <laughs> okay, and, and by the way, by the way, yeah, I see the Ted Lasso there. What was this a couple of months ago? I think you were doing a doing a coaching call. I'm like, Gavin, you are the real life Ted Lasso. So if you need a comparison, <laughs> Gavin is a uh, six foot seven, six foot eight. Ted Lasso. That's, that's pretty much how I would describe it. I just don't have the mustache game that he has. I wish I did, but I just don't have the mustache game. So I'll work. That's right. It. I still can't grow facial hair and I'm 34. So <laughs> There's, there's something else too that I want to, that I want to like leap off of here with this. So, you know, we're talking about, about the high performers mindset and, and all these things and, and, and shifting judgment into curiosity, right? One other part of that, that I'll often work on with my clients is how can we go from stacking losses? Right. So it, when we're judging ourselves and when we're constantly thinking that we're not good enough and we're messing up and we're only focusing on the, the mistakes, we really start to get into this mode where, where we're just stacking losses all the time. Right. No matter how many good workouts that person had that week or anything, it's like, ah, oh, but I ate the fries and then, oh, well, screw it. I won't go to bed on time and I'll have a beer and then I won't wake up on time. And that kind of like starts to spiral into losses. Right. Can we shift that focus to stacking wins? Can we start stacking wins and stacking evidence that we are good enough, that we are on the right path, right? Because that person in eating those French fries just forgot about all the great workouts they had, all the days where they nailed their calories and their macros, all the great sleeps that they had. Maybe they're even forgetting about the fact that this was a meal with their 
significant other that was like an enjoyable meal for an anniversary or a date night or something. And you're forgetting about all these things because you're so busy looking at the losses. And one of the best ways to retrain again, that reticular activating system to look for wins is just simply, I like to call it a brag book, just simply like writing down one win or one brag per day. Where like, where did I do something good? Yeah. Gratitude, brag book, yeah. like, can we bring ourselves into a higher vibrational state with something positive about, about our day? And, 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 and Eric's showing the, the five minute journal. It's one of my favorite tools for shifting into gratitude and more positive mindset. Yeah. And I'll say that's still something that I personally struggle with, right? Like, again, I, I do kind of have that achiever mindset where for me, it's we've got a list of everything we want to do. I know my most important task. And you know what? As the day goes on, I keep adding to that bitch, you know, like <laughs> there's always something new and it can get really easy to continue adding things to your to-do list, things you have to do better, more things you need to do or to be perfect. And without taking the time to actually reflect, all of a sudden, you had a, a list where you got clear on what one thing you had to do to make the day successful. You blew past that. You added three more things, but then you're looking at the four additional ones you added at 3.30 in the afternoon. You beat yourself up mentally about it. When you can start to build in small rituals and habits and, and frankly, behaviors, yeah, that's how you can really transition that overall mindset. Gavin, one thing you mentioned is the idea of stacking wins. And you work for a great man, Craig Valentine, who's a close mentor for me for years. By the way, I've got his books right back here, The Perfect Day Formula, The Perfect Week Formula. And one thing that, that Craig really teaches is how to optimize your morning, how to optimize your day. And frankly, a big piece of that is stacking wins. Uh, can you elaborate on the idea of stacking wins and maybe some rituals that, that someone could use in the morning and then maybe something at the end of the day to really start shifting their mindsets and beliefs to you know, optimize that mindset? Yeah, I think I think actually this would be valuable like for me to just share what I've started doing since I since I've been working with Craig in in terms of my mornings and actually what's really important and you touched on this is that your morning routine is actually one the evening before. And I've actually shifted, Craig calls it his end of day routine. I've actually shifted the way that I say it to it's a head start session. As soon as you and I get off of this call, I've got my head start session. And what I'm going to do in that is I'm going to decide, okay, what's the number one thing I'm going to do tomorrow morning in what I call my magic time block, which I'll explain in a minute. What's that thing that I'm going to do that, like Eric said, is going to be a win for the day. So if I do this thing, my day is one already. By like 7 a.m., I've already won my day. So what is that one thing? And then also, how can I how can I grease the groove and make it a little easier? You know, can I get a couple bullet points for that? Could I open up the document on my computer, whatever it is? If it's a workout, this is kind of the oldest trick in the book, but I think it's worth saying. Can I lay my gym clothes out? Can I, you know, can I get my my pre-workout or my coffee ready to go beforehand? Can I make sure my shake's ready? Like all these things of just like, can I make my life easier in the morning? When we're in the morning, we have like the least amount of restrictions, right? We are like the most locked in. There's, there's no, if you get up early enough, there's no outside noise, right? There's like nothing coming in at you. And I mean, even if you don't get up that early, if you just stay off that bloody phone, then you'll be okay. Then it's like, okay, once you've decided what that most important thing is, the more you can shorten the time span between when you wake up and when you start doing that thing, the better right? The sooner you can start doing that thing, the better off you're going to be. That's when you can really start to hit it. Because now, yeah, I've gotten up and I've already gotten started within, I don't know, say, you, you know, you go to the washroom and you shower, whatever it is that you had to do in the morning. I've already started my first priority. Now that's our, we're already starting to stack wins, right? And then, so what I do is I get up and, and I, I don't like to work out first thing in the morning. It's, it's one of the things that Craig gets a lot of heat for. Uh, he says like, don't work out first thing in the morning. And the reason is because he likes people to like get their stuff done and like get your work done and then you can go work out after. So for me, I'll get up right away. And while I'm, um, I don't drink coffee anymore. I just drink decaf. I do the mud water thing. So shout out to mud water. That means that I have to boil the, the water in the morning. I can't like preset the, the kettle to like boil in the morning. So while the water is boiling, I've got my glass of salt water and I just do my, I do my journaling and I call it my daily vibe check where it's like, how did yesterday go? Did I learn anything yesterday? And then do a quick emotional check in. What am I feeling? And what is that trying to teach me? So I do a little, you know, like one page of journaling, then usually the, the coffee's ready. And then I'm going in, 
right into my number one task, which is which is what Vince likes to call, you know, a make money later task. Craig calls it like a newy task, non-urgent, important, something that's like a big picture task that's going to move the needle on your business or move the needle on your life. That's usually what I dive into first. Uh, lately, that's been working on the book that I'm writing. Sometimes it's even like moving forward on some of my content stuff so that I can make sure that that gets shared, whatever that is for you. And again, this can be a workout if that's what it is. And then once I'm done that, so that's about a that's about a 90 minute time block. So then about 8 a.m. is when I'm going into my emails for the first time. And that's when I do my like client checks, you know, what's going on for the day, all that kind of stuff. And and now by the time it's 8 a.m., I've stacked like four or five wins already and I haven't even dug into my emails yet. And that's a that's a good feeling. Yeah. And mentally at that point you are already positive, you're winning, you've conquered your day before you have any reactive energy really kicking in to der derail you, right? Where most people will wake up and have the monkey mind of see what happened yeah. on the oh, on the news, Slack channel with work and some emergency. And the more you can carve that time out in the morning to do something proactive towards a big goal that you have, it's going to make such a big difference. Um, I probably told this story before, but you know, even for me, when I got started in building bot performance when I was like 22, 23 years old, in the gym by five or six in the morning, you know, five days a week to work with my clients. I quickly learned that if I don't do these things that are going to build my business going forward first, there's always going to be something else in the way. And I had to make a decision early on, you know, when I was still dating, you know, my wife, Lauren, it was like, do I want to sacrifice time with her in the evening? to work on this thing or do I want to do it in the morning when I have a little bit more control? For me, it was, listen, I don't care what time in the morning I have to get up, 3.30, 4 in the morning, I would get up and I would write. I would create content. I would create something that puts value out in the world. And doing that while working, you know, crazy hours as a personal trainer would, you know, 12, 15 hours where you're available for clients to pay the bills. That's how I built the foundation for my business really early on. And like having that same mindset now, still even in business, you know, I'm still up at 4.30, 5 in the morning, you know, depending on kind of a rotating schedule because I know my daughter's going to be up at 6.30. And so that right. gives me enough of a time to get a work block in or frankly, for me, what that time is right now, it's really, it's just reading and learning and research because that's something that I will skip otherwise once the work right. day takes hold. Whether you're in business and you're trying to to build something, whether that non-urgent but important task that maybe hasn't been a priority is taking care of your health because it allows you to show up in every other area, you've got to do that thing first. And when you start stacking wins that are for you personally, it sets forth, the ball just gets rolling and your day's already a win, right? Versus if you wait until later in the day to do that important thing, when you're in a reactive state, it's so much harder to do when you're stressed out, when you're tired, and when there's so many other tasks that are probably arrived on your plate. Yeah, and I, I think that you make a point there when you're when you're talking about your story, you're always gonna, I, I made this post today and you comment on it. There's always going to be trade-offs. There's always going to be sacrifices you have to make based on the context of what you want in your life. And Craig says it all the time, values and vision drive every decision. Based on your values as who you want to be as a human being and your vision for what you want in your life, that's what you use to make those decisions, right? So you had a specific thing you wanted to do. And that was inspiring for me at the time. I was like, this guy, I can't say that there's no time for me to write or for me to, you know, work on my business. This guy's doing it at 3.34 in the morning. Like I saw that as a, as, you know, and that was encouraging for me. Eric and I, Eric has kids. I don't have kids yet, but like we, we know that like you're busy, like you've got a lot of shit going on. Are you willing to sacrifice something for the thing that you want most? And if you are and you stick to that, you're going to be rewarded for that. You're going to be rewarded in so many ways because you're just like doing what's in alignment for you. Another important point there is like make sure that that's based on your what you see as success and your values and vision, not something that's borrowed from Eric Bach or borrowed from someone on Instagram or borrowed from me. It's what you want for your life. And when you do that, everything that you touch is going to turn to gold. It's amazing when it happens, right? It's yeah. that's why I say fitness is a force multiplier, because when we just using fitness as the example, when you start taking care of yourself, it bleeds over, not just the improvements in terms of cognitive function and all these other areas. But the big thing is you set an intention to do something and then you live in alignment with that. And when you live in alignment with the things that you value most, it builds a confidence to attack so many different areas of your life, right? The, the self-belief that is built through transforming your body, through making gradually better decisions, forgiving yourself if you're not perfect with it and just getting back on track. It gives you a set of skills 
that you can apply to every other area in your life. It's so profound, which is why I think, you know, there's, it's always kind of a running joke where you see like the personal trainer does pretty well and then it's like, oh, they become a copywriter or they become something else on the internet. Well, it's because they learn all these additional skills that they've harnessed through delaying gratification with the things that they're doing in the gym. And then they find success and maybe something else that's in alignment with what they want to do a little bit differently as they mature and as they grow up. Now there's me, just a, you know, fucking 34 year old meathead who just wants to lift weights all day still, but you know, <laughs> but you know, it's different for, for everybody across the board. And I just think that's such an important aspect. I agree. Let's talk about replacing some of these limiting beliefs and just dig into that a little bit more, right? Everyone has some limiting beliefs. Let's say we have something that's going on right now. It's like, I, I just can't do this thing. Uh, I'm just not the person that's fit. I'm just not the person that's healthy. I don't have the time or the energy. Like, how do we start to break through these and, and gradually replace them? Yeah, so, well, the first thing, it's funny, like the, the replacement of them is quick, but the evidence building is what is gradual. I've learned from someone named Byron Katie, and it's called the four questions. And so you've got this thing, you know, I'm not good enough for, I'm, I'm lazy, let's say. There's four questions. The first question is, is this true? And this is your opportunity to share all the evidence you have that it's true, all the times you were lazy before and all that stuff, right? But the second question is like, is this a fact? Like, do you know this to be true without a shadow of a doubt? And it's like, if there was ever one time where you weren't lazy, then it's not a fact that you're lazy. So that allows us that and just enough of a spark, just enough of a, a, of a light at the end of the tunnel to take it. And then question three and four are really to like, dig into what happens when you live in this identity, right? So question three is what happens when you buy into this belief, right? And essentially what this always comes down to is it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If I believe that I'm lazy, then I will look for evidence that I'm lazy and I will find evidence that I am lazy. And then that will further that vicious cycle of me being lazy. Question number four flips it on its head. What could happen or who could you be if you chose to believe something different? And that's the big thing, right? So like I said, it happens quickly. All you gotta do is choose to believe something different. You just have to make a decision to believe something different, right? So then you can say, well, you know, maybe I'd be the, you know, the first person in my family with a six pack or, or, you know, the first millionaire in my family, or I'd be a more present parent, or, you know, I'd be more involved in my community, whatever it is. So now we can use that and replace this old belief with a new truth that serves us better. So if it's, I am lazy, maybe that new truth that serves us better is, I am becoming better every day, or I am becoming healthier every day, or something like that, right? It doesn't need to be like, I am full of energy, right? Because that's probably bullshit, right? It's just like, we need <laughs> something, right? We gotta find something that serves us better than this old belief, and that could be anything. As long as it's about us, right? As long as it's something that's about us personally, right? And then the job is, and this is why I say that really ingraining it is gradual, then you got to go find evidence. Your subconscious brain and your reticular activating system need evidence to really ingrain these new beliefs, right? So I can stand there. There's a great Alex Hormozzi quote says, you know, you don't build confidence by screaming affirmations in the mirror. You need an undeniable stack of proof that you are who's, who you say you are. I like to change it to an undeniable stack of wins that you are who you say you are, right? An undeniable, just stack those wins, right? So now you gotta go find evidence of all the times when you're not lazy. Every time you get out of bed, you're not being lazy. Every time that you go that extra mile to like make the healthier meal, you're not being lazy, right? Every time you get up and walk to the water cooler to get water, you're not lazy, right? Looking for all these all these little things that start to add up that make your new identity. That's what's most important is once you've decided that you're gonna shift, what are the things, the habits that that new person does and how are you living in those? That's fantastic. Look for evidence and build irrefutable proof of wins. It's so true because again, everyone has times where they're not fully in alignment, but when you do act, you have to give yourself credit for those time periods. And note that. Yeah, there's one more thing there, right? Like, it's okay if you don't act in alignment sometimes. Think of this as casting votes. 
as long as you cast more votes for the for the new belief and for the best version of yourself then then the votes that you cast for the old version of yourself then you're going to be moving in the right direction yeah this isn't the electoral college here this is a straight popular vote right it's just <laughs> i mean hey say what you want about the electoral college you know but this this is just straight up if you get more votes on one side that side wins that's it kind of a parting thought here is like you know look at the things that you're doing were you better are you making better decisions than you were before Yes. I'm um, in the case of the meal where you're having, you know, the turkey burger and fries. Like, well, before you might have got like a double decker burger with bacon and cheese and all kinds of other bullshit on it. Like you're making better choices. You don't have to be perfect. And Who even determines win. what like, perfect is? You can reframe that, that quote unquote loss into a win. Definitely. And that's such an important thing, being able to reframe things and look at them objectively from where you're coming. Because listen, you can try to compare ourselves against some perfect ideologue, but none of that exists. No matter what bullshit you see on social media, it, it comes down to being better than you were previously. I believe, and please jump in here, but when we start stacking wins and being better than we were before, that's when we change our mindset. That's when we change our beliefs. That's when we change our future. Yeah, it's, it's this wonderful cycle of is it chicken or the egg, right? Is it changing the mindset that allows us to take the different actions or is it taking the different actions that allows us to change the mindset? And I think it's a little bit of both. I think these things work in context with each other. Definitely. Jay Ferrucci told me this and it was act your way into thinking differently. Love that. Love that. So, man. Another way to think about it. Awesome. Well, Gavin, this has been an incredible discussion. Always good to see you and chat with you. Brother, where can we find out more about you? Tell us about your book. Uh, yeah, so the book is, we're working on it. Working title currently that I'm not 100% sure on yet is Unlock Your Potential. And it's a lot of this stuff and some stories about my hockey my hockey life and my business coaching life. You can find me on Instagram at Gavin McHale one We are working on changing that, but uh, Meta has some rules in place that uh, don't let you change it. Gavin McHale one will take you there. Um, and if you want, like if you got specific questions and you really, you know, you're not on Instagram, or whatever, just send me an email, gavin at craigballantine.com. I'd love to talk to people. Awesome. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Hey, it's Eric here again. Now, there are three ways that I can help you look great naked. Number one, if you want to grab a free copy of the Look Great Naked Protocol to help you lose body fat without counting calories, then go to bachperformance.com backslash free training. Number two, if you're a busy guy looking to build muscle, then I recommend checking out our Minimalist Muscle Blitz, which has helped over 1,000 men build muscle without living in the gym. Just go to minimalistmuscleblitz.com. The link will also be available in the show notes. Or number three and last, if you want to work with me directly and get the best results possible, apply at bachperformance.com backslash coaching to look great naked without living in the gym. Until next time, my friend.